So you know how to design a LAN anyway. Well, at least you know the concepts of we can use different topologies, different arrangements of nodes. We need to choose a transmission medium. Do we use twisted pair? Do we use coaxial cable? Do we use wireless? Although we, I don't think we mentioned that. Wireless is another opportunity. If we have a building that we cannot deploy cables in, it's too hard to put cables through the walls, then wireless is an option. And we finished yesterday looking at, okay, in some of the cases with, different, with a multi-point medium, if two people transmit at the same time, we get a collision of frames. Therefore, we have medium access control to make sure that only one transmits at a time. And we looked at those examples of different approaches. We're not going to get to go into any more detail about MAC. Just understand what it is and perhaps understand the difference between those different approaches. The details about the performance and so on is interesting, but we have no time for that. What we want to do today is look at a particular type of local area networks uh, and a set of standards and technologies that are used in practice. IEEE is an organisation that creates standards. 802 is just the number that they use to refer to a set of standards for local area networks and metropolitan area networks. And in fact, 802.3 is the number of the standard that refers to uh, the most typical type of LAN technology in use today, the star-based Ethernet wired LANs. So we'll go through them. So IEEE stand as an organisation that creates standards as well as does other things. And 802 is just the name or the number of the committee that creates standards about local area networks. They create many other standards. Firewire, you know, one, IEEE 1394 is used for connecting digital cameras to computers and so on, and many other standards. Wireless LAN, we'll see, is covered in here. So, although they have official names for the technologies, in fact, they use numbers like 802.3, 802.11. Some common names which are used are Ethernet, to refer to a wired LAN technology, and some improvements of that in terms of speed, fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, some different topology-based LANs, one that uses a ring topology. We saw yesterday when our volunteers passed the token between them. Whenever you have the token, you can transmit. So they formed a ring. Whenever they had the token, they transmit one frame and pass the token to the next person. And that allows that next person to transmit. That's an example of a token ring LAN and wireless LAN, or Wi-Fi is the, I guess, the, the, the trade name and others. So all of these standards, all the technology standardised for wired and wireless LANs by IEEE follow some common architecture. We've gone through this five layer TCP IP architecture, physical up to application, the 802 standards f have some architecture which relates to that as well. They focus on the physical layer and data link layer. Okay? So how to transmit the signals and how to make sure that we efficiently get the data across a link. And in fact, they divide the data link layer into two sub-layers, the logical link control and medium access control. Whereas we know medium access control is the techniques they use so that only one station transmits at a time. Logical link control is for setting up the link, for making sure that we commu communicate with the other endpoint and addressing and a few other factors. Let's see this architecture with the diagram. So here's our original TCP IP stack. The IEEE 802 standards focus on the data link and physical layer. So for all the different technologies, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, which falls in here, and others, there are others other than shown here, they all have a common logical link control protocol. So that use the same thing. The 802.2 is the number of the standard 
for logical link control. So that's common amongst all of them. But then they have their own medium access control technique, whether it uses a token ring based network, or whether it uses a central controller to control who can transmit, reservation based or random based. That's specified in the MAC layer. So there's a MAC protocol for each of these standards. That's why we get 802.11 MAC is for wireless LAN. 802.3 is for wired LANs. And each has a different physical layer. Of course, transmitting signals wirelessly is much different than transmitting them across twisted pair copper wires, and is different again from transmitting across optical fiber. So those details are specified in the physical layer. We're going to concentrate on just wired LANs, 802.3. In maybe other courses, you may especially see wireless LANs covered. Just a very brief summary. Uh, you'll see many of these, or several of these tables in your, in your handouts. Some we'll talk about, some we'll skip over. They just give some examples of the different technologies. For example, Fast Ethernet refers to wired LANs with a maximum data rate of 100 megabits per second. And the transmission media available, most common is unshielded twisted pair. These, these wires, these cables are un, unshielded twisted pair. That is, we have multiple twisted pairs of copper wires. There's some uh, protection to hold them together, the wires together, but it's not providing strong shielding against interference. So this is unshielded. Shielded twisted pair, similar, except there's a, another outer coating and also coating against the individual wires so that they don't interfere. And of course, optical fiber can be used in wired lands as well. But unshielded twisted pair is the most common. There are different access methods. And these refer to the specific protocols used for medium access control. This CSMA CD is similar to a random based access control. The last example we had yesterday, students just randomly chose when to transmit. That's what's used in some of the old LAN technologies. And then just the number of the standard. And we see wireless LAN 802.11 also uses this random access approach. Of course, uses wireless at different frequencies and has different data rates. This is a bit old because wireless LAN actually goes faster than 54 megabits per second now. Let's focus on wired LANs, in particular 802.3, which is commonly referred to as Ethernet. It's the most commonly used LAN standard in the world. It's used in most wired LANs today. Developed 30 or 40 years ago, standardized by IEEE as 802.3, and has changed, has been improved over time. Ethernet became fast Ethernet, an increase in speed, some change in technology, it changed the standard. And now we've even got gigabit Ethernet 10 gigabit per second Ethernet, and there's work on 40 gigabit per second and 100 gigabit per second Ethernet. So it's continually developing. Supports different physical media. So the standards over time have supported unshielded twisted pair, shielded twisted pair, coaxial cable, optical fiber. So you're not limited to just one. Perhaps the original popular Ethernet which become widely deployed, used a bus topology. So if we connected maybe 20 years ago, if SIT had its LAN, then maybe even 10 years ago had its LAN and connected using the original Ethernet, there will be one long cable, the bus, that passes via every computer. And each computer would have a special attachment to that cable via the network interface card. The cable would be using coaxial, would be coaxial cable. And the rate, the typical rate was 10 megabits per second we could send out. It used a random access, medium access control. 
And in fact, it was half duplex. That is, one station transmits, and then in the other direction, you can transmit, but not at the same time. You take in turns now. But this has mainly been replaced by star topology using twisted pair, which is what we have today. We have all the stations connect via a single cable to a central device, a central switch. Some characteristics of this original Ethernet, the 10 megabit per second Ethernet, referred to as 10 base something, where the something is referring to the different transmission media. 10 means the 10 megabits per second. So you could either use coaxial cable, which is the most common, but there are different variations. Uh, you could use unshielded twisted pair, which was less common in those days or even optical fiber was supported. And the different media meant that there were limits on the distance of the bus, that one cable. The distance that it could cover in meters was in the order of 100 meters or up to hundreds of meters. And you could connect no more than a certain number of stations to that bus at the one time up to a maximum of 100 here. Means if we have 200 computers in SIT, we cannot connect them all to the one segment of the LAN. We'd in fact need two separate LAN segments and then have to join them together somehow. So just some examples of different characteristics of some of those technologies. And this is how it worked. With 10 megabits per second, if we have our four stations, it's a shared medium. That is, with the medium access control, only one station will transmit at a time. It, because if two transmit, we get a collision. And we want to avoid that. So the stations follow rules such that in the ideal situation, only one will be transmitting at a time. We can transmit at 10 megabits per second. With four stations, that means, on average, each station gets only 2.5 megabits per second. Just to make sure you're clear on why that's the case, we've got our four stations. Let's break time and say that what's going to happen in the first one second, station A transmits. We don't care who to at this stage to one of the others. And then in the second one second, station B transmits. And then the third one second, C, and then D. And then we'd come back to A and so on. A, B, C, D. If we take in turns, then for one second, A is transmitting and it's sending at a rate of 10 megabits per second. So in that one second, station A transmits 10 megabits of data. So for one second, it can transmit 10 megabits of data because it's sending at 10 megabits per second. In the next one second, how much data does A send? How much data does A send in the next one second when B is transmitting? B is transmitting, A is not transmitting. Oh, B is transmitting 10 megabits. So let's start my timer. A is transmitting for one second and then A is not transmitting. B is transmitting and then C and D. Focus just on station A. In the first one second, it sends 10 megabits. In the second one second, it sends zero. It doesn't send anything. It's not transmitting. B is sending, but station A is not. In this time, C is transmitting. A is sending nothing. In this time, D is sending. And then in this fifth one second, A can send another 10 megabits. 10 megabits. And so on. That is, from A's perspective, 
it's transmitting just one quarter of the time. If we keep doing this, then we'd see on average every four seconds A gets to transmit 10 megabits. 10 megabits. Every four seconds, A gets to transmit 10 megabits of data. 10 megabits divided by four equals two and a half megabits per second. So, in a shared medium, and the bus topology is a shared medium, where only one station can transmit at a time, we share the capacity amongst the set of stations. With four stations, we have a capacity of 10 megabits per second. Each station, on average, only gets one quarter of that 10, which is 2.5 megabits per second. Same with station B. In, its, uh, in every four seconds, it would be able to transmit 10 megabits of data, averaging out to 2.5 megabits per second. What happens if instead of we had four stations attached to our network, we had ten stations? What's the average rate per station? One megabit per second. That is, if we can send at ten megabits per second, but there are ten stations, then my station only is transmitting one-tenth of the time. So if we follow the same approach, we'd get one megabit per second per station. The more stations in the network, the less each station gets in terms of capacity because we have to share it amongst everyone. That's a problem. Put 100 in here and now the speed at which your station can send on average is down to 100 kilobits per second. So the more stations you add to the network, the less each station can send the performance goes down. In fact, that's, a, that's an issue that arises in any shared medium network. It's the same in wireless LAN. Wireless LAN, your laptop transmits and it's transmitting on a shared medium. If I have my wireless LAN can support a data rate of 54 megabits per second. But if there are five other laptops, or a total of five laptops all wanting to send, then we have to divide that 54 amongst the five. And we're going to get less than 10 megabits per second each. And in fact, there are even some other overheads. So with a shared medium, we divide the capacity amongst the number of stations. The more stations, the lower the capacity per station. That was in a bus topology, which was the original Ethernet was deployed in a bus topology. Some improvements allows it to move into a star topology, where instead of everyone connecting to one bus, they connect via point-to-point -point links to a special central device. And in this example, the central device is called a hub. So this central device can... Well, there's two basic approaches it can take. One we'll look at now is the hub, and the next one will be a switch. And there's an important difference between them. What a hub does is when it receives a frame on an input link, in this example, B is transmitting a frame to the hub, the central device. The hub transmits a copy of that frame on all other output links. Doesn't care who the destination, who the destination is. If B is sending to D, one data frame, B transmits to the hub. The hub makes three copies of this frame transmits on all the other output links. The hub doesn't care who the destination is. 
in that it doesn't have to look at the destination address. Because it sends to all others, it's going to reach the destination. If the destination was D and the hub sends to A, C and D, of course D receives the frame. A and C also receive the frame, but they will ignore that frame because the address in the header will not identify them. So what a hub does, transmits a copy of the frame on all other output links. Receives on one link, transmits on the other output links. With a, a hub in this arrangement, we still have a shared medium. If two stations transmit at the same time, although the point-to-point -point links are not shared, there will be a collision at the hub. If the hub transmits, the, or the hub cannot transmit both of them at the same time. It can only transmit one frame at a time. So, even though we have point-to-point -point links using a hub, we, in the entire network we still have a shared medium. That is, we cannot allow two stations to transmit at the same time, otherwise we'll get collisions. So we use some medium access control technique to make sure only one station transmits at a time. One of those techniques that we went through yesterday, for example. It doesn't matter which one, it depends on different scenarios. But the result is, in our network, only one station is transmitting at a time. And the performance is the same as this. If B transmits its data, and then it goes to all the destinations, and that takes one second, and then another station can transmit, and that takes one second, and then another one, and so on. So, on average, each station would get 2.5 megabits per second data rate. We have to divide the 10 amongst the number of stations. So, in fact, using a hub doesn't change the performance compared to using a bus same performance. It does make th some things easier in deploying the network. Sometimes in, a, in different buildings, deploying a hub-based network or a star-based topology is easier, physically easier, than having a bus that passes by all computers. And if there's a failure on this link, these three can still communicate. But with a failure here, on this portion of the link, then we stop some of the com more of the communications. So a star topology is more fault tolerant than a bus topology. The next improvement, and it arrives at what we have today, is to use the same topology, but the device does something different. And in fact, instead of calling it a hub, we call it a switch. What a switch does, if B transmits, the switch looks at the destination address and sends only on the link to get to that destination. If we draw that, or if we draw the two approaches, In our hub-based topology, So it's in fact the same topology, it's just that the functionality of the central device differs in these two cases. In the hub, if we transmit on one link, then the hub sends a copy on all other links. If the frame, which contains data, in the header had a destination 
equal to C, the hub doesn't look at the destination address. It just receives the frame, send to every other link. It can do that quite quickly. It doesn't need any processing to look at the frame. Means the hub, when you implement it, is quite simple and can be done cheaply uh, at a reasonable speed, at a processing rate. In a switch, what happens? If A transmits a frame, has some data, has a destination equal to C, the switch receives the frame, looks at the destination address. OK, this is going to destination C, send only on this link. B and D do not receive a copy, only C receives a copy. So that's the difference between a hub and a switch. Same topology, it's just what the central device does. Which one's better? Switch is better in what way? Maybe I've written it in the lecture notes. Switch is more efficient use of our network. Here we use, we're transmitting a copy of the frame on three links, when in fact we only really need to send it on one of those three. We're wasting time transmitting on those links when we just need to transmit on this link. This, so this is more efficient use of the network because we only transmit on the link that it needs to go on. In fact, what it allows in a switch, if our switch is fast enough, while we're transmitting the data from A to C, we can also have D transmitting another frame to B. So we could have those transmissions happening in parallel. In a hub-based network, that's not possible because we'll get interference, we'll get collisions. So in fact, we can be using the links at the same time to transmit different data. So the performance of the network, or performance per station, increases. And it turns out, if we can achieve our maximum data rate. Here with four stations, we get 2.5 megabits per second per station. We need to share the total capacity of 10 megabits per second amongst the four stations. With a switch-based network, if we have a capacity of 10 megabits per second, each station can get the full 10 megabits per second per station. So we no longer need to share amongst the stations. Every station gets the full capacity. That's much better in terms of performance. Instead of four stations, have 100 stations. Or in fact, maybe 10 stations. Because most switches don't support more than 32. If we have 10 stations, in this case, each station, each computer get a maximum of 1 megabit per second. In this case, each computer gets 10 megabits per second. 10 times increase in performance by using a switch. What's the problem of using a switch? It is more complex. That is, the device itself is more complex. The device, the switch, needs to look at the frame, look at the destination address, and know that, OK, to reach C, I need to send on this link. So somehow the switch needs to know that C is attached to this link. In the hub, it didn't need to know that. It receives a frame, just send on all of them. Of course, it will reach C. I don't care if C is here, here, or here. It will reach it, because I've sent to everyone. Hub is cheaper and faster to implement. Switch is more complex. But a switch will give us much higher performance in the network. Is this a switch or a hub? It says on the fast Ethernet switching hub. Okay. In fact, it's a switch in terms of this concept. Most devices you can buy today are switches because even though they are, in theory, more complex than a hub, in practice, it's only going to be a several baht 
difference in implementation costs. So most of, almost all devices you can buy in a shop today, even though they may say a hub in terms of LANs, can act as a switch. In the past, maybe 10 years ago, some networks would use hubs only because they were cheaper than a switch. But now, because of the performance improvement that a switch delivers, and because the price difference doesn't, is not much, maybe several baht, tens of baht in terms of the manufacturing cost, then people buy switches. Yep. Uh, if we go back to our architecture, uh, where was it? We said that LANs, or the 802 standards, focus mainly on the physical layer and data link layer. So they're dealing with layer 1, physical layer, and layer 2, data link layer. So when we talk about a LAN switch, sometimes we distinguish it as a layer 2 switch. It's dealing with layer 2 switching. <coughs> when we start to look at the internet protocol and come back to packet switching, we'll start to deal with a network layer. Similar concept using a switching, it uses switching, but it's operating at a different layer and is using for connecting between LANs. And that would be referred to as a layer 3 switch. Functionality may be similar, but they're operating, or they're being used for a different purpose. A layer 2 switch for switching inside a LAN, a layer, layer 3 switch for switching between LANs and WANs wide area networks. We'll cover a little bit more about that in the next topic. A layer 2 switch, or perhaps more commonly, an Ethernet switch, because Ethernet is the common name for the technology. So this is what we use today in most of our LANs. A layer 2 switch allowing everyone to transmit at the full capacity. But in fact, today, we're not limited to 10 megabits per second. The most common is 100 megabits per second, referred to as 100 base T. And again, when we're sending at 100 megabits per second using Ethernet or fast Ethernet, there are different transmission media that we can choose. The most, uh, a common one is here using unshielded twisted pair. You use two different pairs. And we can deliver at 100 megabits per second per station. Usually there's a limit on the length of the cable. We use different signaling techniques. You recognize some of these acronyms, non-return to zero and so on. Some are more complex than what we covered in the, in the course. So just some examples of the technology. And in fact, so we've gone from 10 megabit per second Ethernet to 100 megabit per second fast Ethernet, which is commonly used today. And there's 1 gigabit per second Ethernet. And there's others as well. In 1 gigabit per second Ethernet, again, we can use optical fiber, twisted pair, or unshielded and shielded cable. And they have different physical characteristics, like the distance at which they can cover. You don't need to remember them. It's just giving you examples of some of the technologies. This is just an example of a configuration of a LAN, where, in fact, we have star topologies but multiple segments combined together. Here, let's say we have the network for uh, faculty members. There are a number of PCs for our office PCs. There's a printer, there's a server. All of those devices connect via a separate cable to a switch, a layer 2 switch or an Ethernet switch. Similar, this may be for the staff members in the finance office. They would have their separate network with some computers, a printer, and their own server. 
And this may be for labs or some other part of the organization. And this may be just for our servers, like our web server, email server, and different and database server that we use. And we separate them into different segments and combine them together via a central switch. So we think of this as our company LAN. But in fact, it's com composed of a combination of four different star topologies combined together in an overall star topology. So just an example that we can connect different segments together. And the design and how to do that depends upon the organization. Do you want to separate physically the students from the staff? There may be some security reasons for doing that so that we have some devices or some portion of the network just for staff and one portion just for students and have some device in the middle that can block any traffic to go between the two when inappropriate. And just another example that, in fact, we don't have to limit ourselves to the same technology in the entire LAN. Here we have some workstations, some PCs, connected via 100 megabit per second links in a star topology. And then we may connect that, in this case, by a 1 gigabit per second link to some larger switch. So this may be staff, faculty members. This may be students, physically separate, two different segments. These may be 100 megabit per second links. These are switches. And these switches connect to another switch via a 1 gigabit per second star topology. And they may connect to some servers that we all share. And in fact, there could be another connection out to the internet. So there are different arrangements that we can achieve and we can combine different topologies, star, mesh, bus, and we can combine different technologies. 10 megabit per second ethernet, 100, 1 gigabit per second, and so on, depending on the requirements of the users. Most network interface cards today will support multiple technologies, that is, this is an old one, it may be 10, 15 years old. It supports both 10 megabit per second Ethernet and 100 megabit per second Ethernet. Your laptop that you buy probably supports three, 10, 100 and 1 gigabit per second Ethernet. So the devices support multiple technologies. Which one does it use depends upon the switch that it connects to. If this supports 10 and 100, but this only supports 10, this one will revert to the lower 10 megabit per second when it connects to the switch. Same if your laptop supports 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, and 1 gigabit per second, it will only use 1 gigabit per second if it connects to a switch that supports 1 gigabit per second. And in SIT, not many of them do because there's an addi additional cost. Just one more example of configurations. So that's a summary of 802 local area networks, especially wide local, local area networks. The last thing we want to look at, because it becomes important in later topics, and we see a lot of it in practice, is the structure of the frames that we transmit. Here we had a frame. I said there's some data and a destination address. Let's look at the precise structure of this frame because we'll see that it comes up a lot in different topics and in practice when you look at using networks, it's important to know. The frame structure and the address structure for wired LANs. So this puts the perspective of a MAC frame with respect to other layers. So remember what we do with our layered structure is the application generates data. That's the green bo box here. Your 
web browser generates some data to transfer to the web server. This is the original data here. It's sent to the next lower layer, TCP in this example, the transport layer, adds some header, does some processing, and that's combined and sent to the next layer, IP in this case, which adds a header. In the next topics, we'll look at the structure of these headers. Lo logical link control layer or sub-layer adds a header. If you go back to one of the first slides on our architecture, we have application, transport, network, and then in the 802 standards, the data link layer is broken into two sub-layers. So this is our normal five-layer stack. Application, transport, network, data link, physical. But in the 802 standards, they divide the, physical, uh, the data link layer into two sub-layers. Logical link control and MAC. So in fact, we get a header from the logical link control layer. And then the MAC layer, which we're going to focus on, adds a header. It also adds something at the end, a trailer. And the purpose of the trailer is some checksum. Remember when we looked at da digital data communications, we spoke about parity bits. We mentioned CRC. These are techniques used to check if there are any errors in the data. That's what's included at the end of the frame here. So we say our MAC frame, the thing that is sent from the MAC layer to the physical layer, is this. Where, from the perspective of the MAC frame, here's the header, here's the MAC data, and here's the MAC trailer. We want to look at the structure of that header and trailer. Do we need to look at this? Some parts of it. Here it shows us the structure of the MAC, MAC frame. Let's write it on the board to make it clear what's important. So when I gave an example of saying sending a frame from A to C, this is the MAC frame. It contains some data and a header, but in practice, well, this doesn't show a trailer. In the real protocol, it contains a header, some data, and something at the end, a trailer. That's this frame here. The header is made up of three fields some information to use for the control of uh, the transmission. We'll see the structure of that, I think, shortly. A destination address and a source address. Okay, so the header must include which station sent the frame and which station is intended to receive the frame. In this example, the addresses indicate the stations. So the source address would be an address of C in our example, and the destination an address of computer or station A. Then we include the data, and the trailer is a checksum to check. So when the receiver receives this, you can check are there any errors in the frame. And it uses the CRC checksum to perform the error detection. We didn't go through the details of CRC checks, the, the CRC algorithm, but it performs error detection. 
If there are bits in here that are different from what was transmitted, it should be detected. Or well, there's a high chance it'll be detected. There's further details about the logical link control header. But today, in a lot of LANs that are used, the logical link control header is not needed and is not included. In theory, it can be used, but in practice, in many of the networks we use, it's not included. We just have the MAC header and the MAC trailer. This slide gives the structure of the logical link control header. It's a bit more complex. We're going to skip over that because in practice it's not seen very often. In most cases, all that we know is that... Oh, maybe we'll see that later. So we can ignore the logical link control header for now. All that we include, we have our destination address, source address, and we include in place of the logical link control header some field which indicates the type of data included in here. So some number that indicates what's inside our frame. What type of data is it? And it normally refers to the higher layer protocol. So our MAC frame is quite simple. Destination address, source address, and a field that indicates the type of data included in here. And then followed by a checksum. It's called a frame check sequence here. Something to check if there are any errors in the data. So from here to here is the MAC frame. The rest is just placing that in the perspective of the total packet that's transmitted. The maximum size of data is typically 1,500 bytes. That's a part of the standard. So here, 1,500 bytes. The destination address is fixed to 6 bytes. How many bytes in an octet? One octet is one byte in this course. An octet is 8 bits, a byte is 8 bits in this course. So where they use an octet, we mean a byte here. Destination address is 6 bytes, source address is 6 bytes, the type is 2 bytes, the maximum amount of data is 1,500 bytes, and the frame check sequence, the CRC error detection, is 4 bytes. The other parts shown here are considered part of the physical layer and not so much of interest to us. So our typical Ethernet frame contains a header of 6 plus 6 plus 2 bytes, 14 bytes. Data, which may vary in size, maybe 100 bytes, 1,000 bytes. The maximum is typically 1,500 bytes. There are some extensions to make it larger, but this is the most typical. And a 4-byte trailer. Total size of our MAC frame up to 1,518 bytes. The last thing we want to look at is what is the structure of the addresses? We said we include a source address and a destination address. They're not letters. They're binary values of a particular structure. And we've seen them before. They are 48-bit addresses, so they're binary addresses, 48 bits in length, referred to as an IEEE MAC address or an IEEE 48-bit address. It's a common format used in many protocols and standards. The idea is that each 48-bit MAC address is globally unique. Here are two different devices. They should have two different MAC addresses. So each have a 48-bit address assigned to them, and it's the manufacturer that assigns that address. They should be different. 
and every device in the world should be different. That's the idea. The way that they make them different is that the manufacturer is assigned some value which is, represents the first 24 bits of the address. So if we have 48 bits, the first 24 bits identify the manufacturer. I don't know if these have the addresses on them. Not that I can easily see. So the first 24 bits ident identify the manufacturer of the device. So every device created by manufacturer 1 will have the same first 24 bits. The next or the last 24 bits are assigned to that individual device based on the manufacturer. So, in fact, these two LAN cards are made by the same company. They're both Compex, uh, made by the organization Compex. Okay? They're bo both made by the same company. So the MAC address of both of these, the first 24 bits should be the same. Same manufacturer, same first 24 bits. But the last 24 bits should be different. So that is used to identify the device based by the manufactured by that company. So long as the manufacturers don't make any mistakes, then we should get globally unique addresses. Of course, in practice, nowadays you can program the address of the device. I can change the MAC address on my laptop to be look like something else, so no longer globally unique. But when manufactured, the aim is to make them globally unique. We don't look at addresses as 48 bits. We, to make them simpler for humans, we, a little bit simpler, we convert them into hexadecimal. And we get groups of six two-digit two digit hexadecimal numbers. So one hexadecimal digit represents, can represent four bits. Hexadecimal goes from 0 to 15 in decimal which can represent 4 bits in binary. So we need 12 digits to represent 48 bits. And what we do is we group those 12 digits into pairs of hexadecimal digits. I'll show you some examples shortly. Uh, this address format is used in wired LANs, Ethernet, even in wireless LANs, they use the same address format and in other standards as well. Bluetooth, for example, and different LAN and wide area network standards use similar or use the same address structure. There's a 64-bit address structure, which is a new address format used in different technologies. And there are some others which are not used uh, by IEEE. Let's look at some examples of some addresses. If you have a, a laptop with you or a mobile device, find the MAC address of that device. There's your first task. Someone has a tablet, find the MAC address. On your phone, you may be able to find a MAC address. Depends on the phone. On a laptop, for sure. Find your MAC address. Find your MAC addresses. How to find it. Sometimes there's a simple way. Sometimes it's written on the bottom of your laptop. It depends. I can't remember. I don't think mine does. Some devices will be written on the back, printed on a, a sticker on the back of the device. Not the serial number. It should be a MAC address which has 12 hexadecimal digits. Let's see if I can find it on my computer.
on, on a computer, normally the operating system lists information about the network interface card. Depends on your operating system what the command is to, to do it. And my computer lists commands, lists the configuration of my network interface, my Ethernet interface. And it just simply prints out the hardware address or the MAC address. You see it's 12 hexadecimal digits. Convert each digit to a, or each pair of digits to 8 bits and you get your 48-bit MAC address. So there it is. And it should be fixed for my device. That is, the manufacturer of the LAN card in my laptop assigned this address. I also have wireless LAN on my laptop. So I have both wired Ethernet and wireless LAN, two different network interfaces. Wireless LAN uses the same format of address. So it's a different address, you see, but same format. It's a 12 hexadecimal digits or a 48-bit address. So it depends upon your device and the, soft, the operating system, you, system you're running as to how to find it, but you'll be able to find it. It's, it's there somewhere. In a phone, it's much harder. In a computer, it's easy to find on Windows, on Linux, on a Mac, easy to find the Mac address. In Windows, on the command line IP, IP config in, in Unix and in, uh, even in a Mac, IF config, I think, will provide it, or simply IP. And in Windows, IP config will, should give the information. Or in Windows, in the graphical interface, you can find the network interface, look at properties, and you should find the MAC address there. What do we know about my two different network interface cards? Based on just the MAC address, what do we know? What can we conclude about the manufacturers of them? Yeah, they are made by different companies. Remember the first half of the MAC address identifies the manufacturer. The second half identifies the device within that manufacturer. The first half means the first six hexadecimal digits. 002454 is manufacturer A. 00265E is manufacturer B. In practice, they may be the same company, but they have a, a different assignment of the manufacturer. Sorry. One more example. If I can connect to the internet, I'll show you one more. One infam one the assignment of the first six hexadecimal digits, or in fact the first 24 bits to a manufacturer, there's a public list of who is the manufacturer for which uh, 24 bits. If I can connect to the internet, I'll show you. But otherwise, on this website, and you can try it yourself, you can go there and you enter in a form the first six hexadecimal digits. So I would enter in my address 
002454 onto that website, and it should return the name of the company that manufactured that device and the address and contact information. So you can see that who is the who is the manufacturer assigned for that particular device. See if I can connect and show. Maybe not. I think my wireless connectivity cannot work. So we're too far away. So what you should do is on, on your home computer, on your laptop, when you have it, first find your IEEE MAC address, be able to find it and understand at least the structure, and then you can look it up on this website and find the manufacturer of that device. Sometimes it will be a company that you do not recognise. In most cases, you'll recognise the name of the company who manufactured that device. And that finishes our coverage of lands. So what you need to know about this topic is that, OK, we different approaches for designing a land. You need to select a topology. We've gone through some different cases and the advantages and disadvantages. The transmission medium and medium access control. Controlling one station allowed to transmit at a time. Understand the structure of IEEE 802 lands in that IEEE is a standards organisation. They create standards for different land technologies and they focus on standards for the data link layer and physical layer and they create standards for wired lands, Ethernet, token ring, wireless lands and other wireless standards like WiMAX, Bluetooth and, and, and approximately 20 or 30 different technologies. And then within the IEEE 802 standards, 802.3 is used for wired Ethernet and importantly, the difference between a bus topology, a hub to, or a star topology using a hub, and a star topology using a switch, and how they impact upon the performance. In any shared medium topology, we must share the capacity, say 10 megabit per second data rate, amongst the set of stations. So the per station capacity is the total capacity divided by the number of stations. In a dedicated medium, which is what we get when we use a switch, we get the full capacity per station, and that's a significant performance improvement. And the last thing is about the MAC addresses. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the example of the website, but you can check that website and check your own MAC address in the remaining time you have or before the next lecture. That's finished that topic for today. Next week we'll move on to how the internet works, and in particular IP, the internet protocol.